Peace may be on the horizon, but is the media thirsty for war? And what is more dangerous than Vladimir Putin? Let's talk about it, y'all. Middle America. And you ain't black. The first time ever any. What are you people? We're Americans. We are Americans indeed. What's up, dear listener? <laughs> I feel like I just saw you. My name is Vincent. This is Middle America. We're not left wing. We're not right wing. We're just right. I'm messing with you guys. Uh, Facebook.com backslash America Middle. If you want to join the conversation, we have been covering the UK, the UK, <laughs> the Ukraine and Russia crisis. In the previous episode, we just looked at, we saw that the, that Mr. Zelensky and uh, uh, Mr. Putin have been sitting down discussing, maybe we can have some negotiations for peace and end this uh, waking nightmare that we've all uh, endured just so that we could get some respite to go to the next uh, government slash media created nightmare. Now, having said that, dear listener, uh, speaking of the media, because the media has played a significant role in informing us as to what's been going on, here uh, is a is a clip from Rising. It's called Supercut Media Thirst for War. Let's check it out together. Another part of the landscape that we've been tracking is the fact that the media is like the most hawkish group in the entire country. Right, right. And they only ever, and not just in this particular circumstance, but they only ever push in favor of more escalation and more war. We saw this really clearly with their coverage in Afghanistan. You know, they didn't give a shit about Afghan mm -hmm. civilians for 20 years. And then the minute Biden actually tries to end the war, then for like two weeks, they actually care about Afghan civilians. Mm -hmm. And then once it's over, they again, once again, don't care. And so what we see here mm -hmm. is a consistent drumbeat. They're not pushing the administration over what Ryan Grimm is saying, right. hey, what are you right. doing to enable peace? What are you doing to push for diplomacy here? No, they're consistently pushing for more escalation, potentially provoking World War III. This is a video. Huh. It, it really makes you it really makes you wonder um, what. What angle Tucker Carlson has, because Tucker Carlson has been consistently anti-war. I did not know this, but the, uh, apparently the folks at Fox News, I'm not watching enough Fox, but apparently the folks at Fox News were also advocating for a no-fly zone, et cetera, et cetera. I don't understand this stuff at all, um, but here we go. Compilation put together by The Intercept of the questions that are being asked of uh, the Biden administration routinely. Let's take a look at that. Why does the U.S. believe they know better what Ukraine needs than what Ukrainian officials are saying they need the most? It sounds like, you know, we're pretty dug in on our position when it comes to the no-fly zone, when it comes to uh, the MiGs, uh, despite this growing call, bipartisan call in Congress to shift a little bit. It seems like we're pretty dug in on the no-fly zones and the MiGs, but uh, they want us to shift a little bit. Shift a little bit to what, ma'am? Shift a little bit to what? Shift on the no-fly zones? Shoot down Russian planes? So to put it bluntly, is Zelensky wasting his time tomorrow asking for these things? President Zelensky is going to be speaking to Congress tomorrow. He's been pushing for fighter jets, a no-fly zone. You have to hear some of those same requests tomorrow as well. Has the administration shift, thinking shift them that at all? though calling for a no-fly zone. They're a NATO <laughs> member. Man, this lady, <laughs> this, this lady, this lady's really, really pushing. She, she's really, really pushing for this no-fly zone, huh? Now you're gonna bring Estonia into it, okay? We share a border with Russia. How do we view their calls for a no-fly zone? Yeah. And on presidential. He's addressed tomorrow. Of course, he is expected to ask for more assistance, as my colleague noted. A lot of the U.S. positions on that haven't changed, as you just said, when it comes to the no-fly zone. But on the aircraft specifically, the Pentagon said last week that Secretary Austin said they do not support the transfer of additional fighter aircraft at this time. Good. Is that still the United States' position? Would a, a strike in Poland on supplies or, or anything, really, uh, automatically be met with a military forceful response, or simply a conversation amongst allies about how to respond? There Unbelievable, these people. 
reports that a Russian drone made its way into uh, Polish airspace. That's 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 what we just saw on the on the CNN website. Okay, Th that was 15 March. That was 15 March where she was reporting on that, and it is now uh, 17 March. Happy, uh, what do you call that? Uh, happy St. Patty's Day, by the way. And CNN is still front-paging that on their website and not front-paging the most recent news, which is a sit-down and peace negotiations between Zelensky and uh, uh, Putin, where Zelensky's saying, yeah, the NATO thing sounds reasonable, so does Crimea and Dunbass. And we've got some ideas, too. Nope, we're not going to front-page that, but we are going to page one this story from a couple days ago. Unbelievable. Going back to Ukraine and being shot down, does a drone into Poland count? Former ambassador to Ukraine, Maria Ivanovich, has been quite outspoken recently. And she said, we need to mitigate risk, but it's also true that not taking greater action comes with a risk as well, because Putin is a bully and he only understands strength. Uh, yes, it would risk World War Three. But inaction would also be risky because Putin's a bully and he only understands strength. Do you know where we heard this before, dear listener? Yes, there might be a, there might be a risk that we would be killing innocent people going into Iraq because they may or may not have WMDs. But Saddam Hussein and those Muslims, look at the history of Muslims. They only understand strength, dear listener. Same play, it's literally the same playbook. You, you, you essentialize somebody, you particularize one aspect of their personality, you convince people that they're impossible to be reasoned with, so the only thing you could do is kill him. He can't be reasoned with, I don't know, talk to Zelensky. Seems like they're reasoning very well with one another. Is the president showing enough strength against Putin? If Putin were to use chemical weapons, would it change the president's thinking when it comes to these MIGs taking the no-fly zone off the table? But at least on this, issue, are you prepared? Can you give us any more details about what that threat means of severe consequences? The president obviously made the same threat last week. Is that purely economic consequences, or would there potentially be a military threat? Wow. So you see there just consistent every question. What about the no-fly zone? But what about the no-fly zone? But what about the MiGs? Tell me more about the MiGs. And to the- We ended up sending MiGs, right? Didn't we say we're gonna send the MiGs or was that just a request? I'm not even sure anymore. I'm not even sure. Um, you, uh, did we send MiGs? I'm not sure. Um, I, I don't. I don't know. Somebody confirm or deny uh, uh, whether or not we sent those those mix at the point that Saki actually just recently noted she has answered that question about the planes. She says 167 times. To which Kristen Welker there says, "Well, here's the 168th." If you want to know oh, why shit. I had to get the hell out of that room, <laughs> that's why. I rem I remember just looking around and be like, "Oh, you guys are idiots. You don't you don't know anything." I mean, you're very good at posturing on television. That's I guess that's a skill. Uh, that's it. I mean, they're unable to see a complete one dimension of the impact of their questions of their policy how they can create the, you know the systems and the incentives of which the policymakers will then respond to they are outright pushing for world war 3 why don't you send more weapons who are you to decide that you know better than zelensky we're not saying that we know better for them that in ukraine we know what's good for us that's the that's the exact same thing that Salazar said to Tucker yesterday, uh, we're, who am I to say uh, if peace would be better than war for, for the Ukrainians? That's not for us to say, but it is for us to just write a blank check to continually send them anything they want and then send uh, good American people over there to fucking die when we shoot down uh, Russian jets. It's our place to say that, but who are we to say? If Zelensky comes, Zelensky's asking us for stuff. So then we do get to say, uh, giving you this is not in our best interest. We get to say that. We do get to say, peace is in our best interest, uh, and it's in the best interest of the world. So we don't have to play this faux morality game where we're not going to take oil from the Russians because we're so moral. <laughs> peace is in our best interest. We do get to say that. 
It's this ridiculous sort of faux humility. Who are we to say? Ridiculous. Job of the US government. They have no conception of sovereignty. And over and over and over and over again, why not? Mike, never, milk, 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 milkshake is 100% correct. Poland will never send aircraft to Ukraine. This is insane. Correct. Poland ain't going to do that nonsense. And we don't want them to because Poland is a NATO country, aren't they? more why not more you can see exactly there what is the reward mechanism the more you give the more praise that you get from yeah. the media people will give you as much and then you slow walk yourself into a, a third world war that's the exact opposite of what we should want there is no incentive i used to ask this stuff all the time uh my when when i was most attacked by the white house press corps is when i would press trump on the possibility of peace with north korea because I was most concerned about nuclear war. I'd be like, why don't you invite Kim Jong-un to the- One of the strangest criticisms during the Trump era where people actually lost their minds was when Trump crossed the border and uh, shook hands with Kim. And people were like, oh my God, Trump is terrible, blah, blah, blah. Oh my God, this is the worst thing in the world. I was like, what? how is that bad? What? Guys, as a principal, uh, Offering your hand in solidarity and peace and mitigation of violence as a principle is always better than doing this rah rah saber rattling we're America nonsense. It's always better. Tulsi Gabbard meeting with Assad, better. But these people are so up to their necks in the blood of innocent people that. This was a point of criticism of Tulsi during the debates. They criticized her for meeting with the guy. I don't care. Let me tell you. I'm going to tell you guys something right now. If Tulsi Gabbard is, is front loaded as a candidate uh, for whoever's administration, um, as a, as a leader in a, in a foreign policy position, that is going to massively sway my vote. Massively. Just letting you know right now. We continue. Secretary of State Gabbard. I guarantee you, if we had Secretary of Scabbard, State Gabbard, there would, there would have been no ISIS. There would have been no Arab Spring. There would have been no... We came, we saw, we killed them. Ah! White House, why, when are you going to, do you view his recent outrage as a good faith? These are not the way that you get notice in the press corps or yeah. you get clips. The way you get notice is, why are you not more forcefully denouncing the Kim regime? I, listen, I think what's happening is terrible, but I want to avoid a nuclear exchange. The Correct. political so, rewards are yeah. always on the side of being hawkish, and this is why. The, I mean, the it. only yeah. time they like Trump is when he was bombing Syria. Yeah, that's a good I point. mean, right. every time like a beautiful it's- Beautiful sight or whatever. Yeah, it's yeah. Brian Williams, yeah. oh my yeah. God. But yeah, yeah. And, and- You guys remember that when he said the beautiful, I'm not even going to play it. It's- it, it was just so weird. I remember Jimmy talking about it. I said, oh, Jimmy's doing the hyperbolic thing. That man didn't say that shit. And then we played it, and he was like, the beautiful side of the I was like, holy shit. Soraya's like, wait, what did he just say? She said, rewind that shit, B. I rewound it. That's what he said. These are the people we're dealing with, dear listener. They like war. People were like, this is when he became president. Yeah, he became you know, president. that whole thing. Yeah, I remember that. Um. Yeah, the only political rewards are on the side of hawkishness. And this is how you end up with a landscape where overwhelmingly the American people are saying we have to do more, we have mm-hmm. to do more, we have to do more, without recognizing how much we've already done, which is ex- like extraordinary and historically unprecedented. But because the media's constant drumbeat is you're not doing enough, you're not doing enough, you're not doing enough, you're not doing enough, not doing enough of course that's the pr- impression that's created. And so this is where the three networks, CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News, are really basically indistinguishable. Totally party. You know, 100%. this is complete uniparty stuff, complete bipartisan consensus, always pushing in only one direction. And so you have to know if you're the Biden administration or the Obama administration or the Trump administration that you are going to take a tremendous political hit because, of course, the American public. Or if you're a YouTuber. (laughs) 
at the beginning of this, I was bringing up NATO, and the guy said to me, come on, Finn, stop trying to be an, an intellectual, just go on with the rest of the world. I said, I said, my brother, uh, the rest of the world agreed with me. This was a mainstream position that this NATO shit was going to turn a, a, a Cold War warm and a warm war hot. Th th this was the position of anybody that was remotely conversant with that region for the last 30 years. The majority of the time I've been alive on this planet. I said, what the hell are you talking about? I am in the mainstream position. What he meant was the mainstream position in the last two minutes because all that shit got pushed to the side because we wanted a saber rattle about uh, Vladimir Putin. Look, when they see you getting attacked from all sides for not doing enough, of course that's going to have an impact on public opinion. We saw that very clearly with Afghanistan. I mean, that is when Biden's approval ratings really took yeah, a hit took and back. have never recovered because you had such a consistent drumbeat from the press. And that's exactly... Well, I do think the incompetent way in in which uh, uh, Mr... Mr. Uh, Mr. Biden handled that exit also damaged him severely in in the polls um, because it was just massively incompetent what he what he did. I mean, I mean, honestly, honestly, the way that he handled the the uh, and of course, Americans, Americans are we're, we're massively egomaniacal. I don't care what you what you think. We've got a massive uh, national ego. And so uh, it, it looked like a win for the tally. People kept saying words like embarrassing and humiliating, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, our media played the role of, oh, you're going to let the tally do that to you? Of course, um, Mr. Trump tried to get us out of uh, uh, Afghanistan. But Pelosi and those folks didn't want Mr. Trump to get a win uh, before the election, so they they put the brakes on it. Plus, they released that silly silly thing about you guess you guessed it. The Russians were working with the tally in order to uh, put bounties on U.S. troops, which was a complete lie. It was a lie. We continue. What we're seeing here, you know, you've got a lot of legislators. You already see a shift now. You've got some Democrats now calling for, hey, we got to get these fighter jets to them as well. No fly zone still is mostly off the table. But this is how you end up putting a lot of pressure on the politicians who all want to posture as the ones who are, you know, backing the tough thing and, and mm -hmm. doing the most. So it's a dangerous situation when you have this landscape. Combine it with, remember that exclusive story that we brought you, the audio about the White House press corps yeah. and who gets asked questions and Yeah, don't. that's right. Yeah, well, do you notice where all those people are sitting, folks? Front In row. the front row. Yeah, That's front the mainstream row. media. Correct. And they get to rig the whole briefing. They get to decide how long it takes. They get to decide who gets asked the questions. The people in the back, people like yours truly, who used to be there trying, scrambling to try and get a question. Oh, you don't get a guaranteed question. And these people are the ones who might ask a dissident question about diplomacy. The questions matter. The incentive matters. The White House knows all three of the people they call on the front row who work for the cable networks will be played on loop for millions of people. Mm -hmm. And that is, again, feeds into the incentive structure structure of what they want to say, of how they want to message it to the people. And then when they ask these questions and drumbeat for war, there is no reward for diplomacy. I'll bring yep. it back for the people who are not watching this fully or non None whatsoever. people. What I was talking about in the A block and the diplomacy block was this, which is that most attempts at peace fail. However, as many attempts, as many attempts as you can at peace happen, the more likely that peace eventually does yeah. occur. It takes a long time. And it's it, you can think of it as kind of a negative feedback loop. Calling for peace is really hard because you know you want to save face and all of that. Diplomacy and negotiation is also very difficult. It almost always collapses. There's almost always incentives against it in order to keep fighting. But if you keep trying and trying and trying and trying and trying, eventually you will come to an outcome. And peace is uh. easy. Like the type of negotiated settlement that they would have to come to here, which would involve some really significant concessions from Ukraine, like it's very easy to sort of posture right. against that and, and say, oh, you're still giving media. Russia their way. Right. So that creates all these disincentives for the Biden administration to help support that diplomatic process. And that was another thing we talked about 
um, in the A block is you hear this consistent U.S. lawmakers very happy to talk about the sanctions. We got to do more. Very happy to talk about the military weapons. But very little pressure, I mean, basically no pressure on the Biden administration to actually empower Zelensky in terms of the diplomatic negotiations to try to achieve some sort of deal here by empowering him to say, hey, if Russia actually comes to the table and actually does, right. you know, does their part and gives up a little bit too, that you are empowered to say we're going to roll back the sanctions that have been imposed by the Correct. U.S. and NATO. I would so. love to see a question. What are the red lines for negotiations of the United States and any negotiated settlement? between Ukraine and them. Would you agree with President Zelensky's, uh, you know, ditching of NATO membership? Is that something that the United States would support? Does the Biden administration yeah. stand in support of a negotiated settlement whatsoever? Yeah. Great questions, right? You're not going to hear a single one of them. No, there's never, um, never any pressure for peace. Yeah, never happens. Hey, guys, thanks so much for watching. That's right. Just as never any pressure for peace. Here's Brian. What's his name? What's this guy's name? Brian Stelter, Selter, whatever his name is, a CNN guy. This is a guy that said, uh, why are people listening to Joe Rogan? We have desks. We have an HR department. Uh, here we go. The past 24 hours were a reminder that consumers in an era of YouTube and TikTok still gravitate to trusted, established news outlets during emergencies. They know where to go, so to speak, and television coverage is essential. So, jihad makes it so that people are so terrified that they fall back on uh, the authorities. You see how that works? Of course, Mr. Mr. Stelter, Stel, whatever his name is, is wrong. Because if that was the case, then YouTube would not have had to have such draconian measures of we deplatformed 1,500 people and erased 1,000 videos already and got rid of 600 of Avi Martin's videos overnight for no reason whatsoever and why Jimmy Dore got throttled to pieces and he just recently yesterday uh, hit the 1 million mark. Shout out to Jimmy Dore. So, so even there, he's wrong. You wouldn't need all that assistance from YouTube, Mr. Stelter, whatever your name is, if that were the case. Now, what I put on here was um, uh, what what is more dangerous than Vladimir Putin? And what is more dangerous than Vladimir Putin, dear listener, is very, very easy. The United States media apparatus. Dear listener. There's a very, very strange symbiosis of what's going on between our media and our government. On the one hand, it is clear that our government at points is running the media and the media apparatus. We know that. Th this was clearly demonstrated during the Trump administration. Clearly. Uh, we, we had this debate yesterday where the, the media uh, on, the, on the UK side and the BBC, where the BBC admitted that they, they stifled independent contra-establishment uh, journalism and promoted government propaganda about the Iraq war. We saw this during the Trump administration. Fox News, it was pro-Trump, 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 never did anything. Trump never did anything wrong in his life. Never! Never. Meanwhile, on CNN and MSNBC, you had Rachel Maddow talking about <laughs> Trump <laughs> and the, and the, uh, the P-tapes with the Russian prostitutes. Uh, I heard that not on some uh, shit post from Reddit, Reddit. I heard that in prime time from Rachel Maddow. So we know that the government and the media work hand in hand with one another. We know that. What's interesting is that it seems here in this segment that on top of that, that the media can actually pressure the government to go farther down the line once the propaganda takes a mind of its own. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. I don't believe, I don't believe that um, um, Mr. Mr. Biden was really all about, we're not going to take any oil from Russia. I don't believe that. Because I don't believe he wanted to reduce himself to ben begging Venezuela and uh, and the Saudis, and then getting uh, getting the stiff arm from the Saudis. Because the Saudis know, man, you're done, bro. Right? I don't believe that he wanted to do that. I believe 
what happened was he miscalculated how far the propaganda about how evil Russia is was going to go. I don't think he thought, yeah, people are going to start dumping vodka on the ground and all the rest of it. I don't think <laughs> I don't think he thought about that. So so my my point is the propaganda kind of uh, metastasizes and takes on a life of its own. And then because the media ultimately is beholden to uh, sponsors and capitalism, the more they see that that's taking off, the more then they then insert themselves and become the story and then cycle that pressure back to the government. <laughs> And so they say, hey, man, you're not going to allow for this. Uh, you're not going to allow for this Russian oil. We won't even drink Russian vodka on the streets. You're not going to you're not going to take any Russian oil. And of course, all these folks in the media, they're they're multimillionaires. So it's not going to affect them. It's going to affect you. It's not going to affect them. But Biden knows that he has to get votes, so it's going to affect him. So he was he, hemming and hawing, and then in came the Republicans, who will willingly destroy the economy to fuck with Biden in the midterms. So you see how this crazy symbiosis, alignment, betrayal cycle happens between the media and, and the government. It is way more dangerous than Vladimir Putin. Dear listener, you know, we talked about this earlier where we said, oh, it's the it's the image of the Ukrainian mother cradling a baby that gives us the strength to go on to demand these MiGs and all the other uh, uh, nonsense that that escalates war. Of course, we don't know what happened. I just I just uh, saw Max Blumenthal read a Max Blumenthal article where the Azov Battalion, our good friends over there in the Azov Battalion, were um, impeding civilian flight from Maripol. Maripol is all those civilian casualties. Impeding people running. Look, those people are such liars and they're so brutal, I don't believe anything. We saw, guys, we saw... Um, the clip where the, the kindergarten teachers were arguing with the Ukrainian military about why are you putting the howitzers and why are you firing howitzers so close to my little kindergarten school? They, the Russians, are going to respond. Why isn't our media front paging that information? Well, the answer is very simple. Because if that school gets bombed, they don't want you to have a logical reason for why that would happen. They want you thinking in a certain direction. And they are aware of the power of YouTube and TikTok. As we covered yesterday, with the poor kids in TikTok, they will use soft propaganda. And then with thinking people like you who've already been through the Iraq war, they will use hard propaganda and delete you and demonetize you and destroy your, um, your economic livelihood if you make money as a YouTuber. You see how that works? That is way more dangerous than Vladimir Putin. Dear listener, I keep asking this question. How, who has killed? Who has dropped more bodies in the last 20 years? Vladimir Putin or the United States? Do you know that we are the answer to that question? But here's the thing. We voted for Bush again after we saw what he did in Iraq. He got voted for twice. So did Mr. Obama. Mr. Obama ran out of bombs to kill other human beings, creating the image and likeness of God. He got reelected for doing that shit. And then when Mr. Trump, when Mr. Trump started sending off rockets to Syria, that's when the liberal media finally admitted that he became the precedent for committing an act of war and killing. It is our media that is consistently promoting the Spartan culture because they benefit from it because war always creates viewers and it also always creates fear. And so when you have these legacy stalwart media organization that your mother listened to and your mother's mothers listened to, it's human nature that you're going to go to mommy and daddy. You're going to go to your parents 
You're not going to go to Jimmy Dore in his in his garage. But things have changed, dear listener. And that's why these people want to completely get you off of YouTube and back to watching regular legacy media. So, dear listener, you are more dangerous than Vladimir Putin if you're an American. Yup. I totally believe that, and I am not speaking hyperbolically. Uh, th this company here <laughs> has a higher GDP. The people who made this phone, the people who made this phone have a higher GDP than uh, the entire nation of Russia. You, if you were an American, your military is the most powerful military that has ever been assembled in the history of human beings, and it is not even close. And you have the power, in a collective sense, as an individual, to influence what we do with that massive power and Mr. Putin can't hold a candle to it. And the reason that I know that that is true is because of the way that the media and the government works to filter and curate, curate your consciousness so as to get you to act in a certain way. Now they got that tennis player. Unless he gives a pledge of non-allegiance and uh, disavows Vladimir Putin, now they're going to take his livelihood away from him. You see what's happening? They know how powerful you are, and that is why they're trying to influence your consciousness this way. All right. There you are, dear listener. Do what you will with that, but I think it is the truth. Beware of these snakes in the media. They are horrible, horrible, unscrupulous people. And pretty much anything they say about this conflict is probably not the completion of the story. And it's probably designed to get you to think in a certain direction. All right. Having said that, dear listener, it is time for me to bid you beautiful people adieu. Hmm? In the meantime, love your neighbor, take care of each other. Middle America, we are the media. Till next time, guys.